Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a few minutes. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get going. Good afternoon and welcome to the Blaze Sports 2018 Fall Webinar Series, a deeper dive into adaptive sports and recreation. This free three-part series has been made possible by a grant from the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation. We thank them for their assistance on this project. This series will focus on people with three major physical disabilities, spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, and amputations, and take a closer look into adaptive sports and recreation for each. Each webinar will feature two presenters, one disability-specific expert and one para-athlete or adaptive sports and recreation programming expert in order to provide a well-rounded view of the topic. This webinar will be recorded and available for viewing after completion at blazesports.org. For certified adaptive recreation and sports specialists, CARS, holders, CEUs will be credited upon completion of the short survey at the end of this webinar. For more information on how you can become a Certified Adaptive Recreation and Sports Specialist, please visit the Training and Education webpage at www.blazesports.org. There will be time at the end of this webinar for questions from the audience. To submit a question, please use the Questions tab from the GoToWebinar panel to type your question. We will address as many questions as we can during the time provided. Any questions not addressed will be followed up with via email. Now it's time to officially kick off the second webinar of this series, a deeper dive into adaptive sports and recreation for people with cerebral palsy. We are excited to introduce our two presenters today, Dr. Gavin Colquitt and Pam Carey. We'll start with Dr. Gavin's bio first. Dr. Gavin Colquitt is an associate professor in the Department of Health Sciences and Kinesiology at Georgia Southern University Statesboro campus. He is a certified adaptive physical educator and certified strength coach and conditioning specialist and a fellow of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. Before entering higher education, Dr. Colquitt taught at the middle and high school levels. As a faculty member at GSU, he teaches courses in adaptive physical education and adaptive physical activity. His research interests include disability health, community-based exercise for youth with cerebral palsy, and adaptive physical education. He is also the coordinator for Camp RAD, Recreation for Adolescents with Disabilities, a summer camp for young people with disabilities. Pam Carey has over 35 years of experience working with persons with disabilities as a teacher, coach, official, and statewide program director for Louisiana Gumbo, Inc., which stands for Games Uniting Mind and Body. Pam is also a national athletics classifier for the U.S. Paralympics. She has also traveled abroad as a coach for the Junior USA team to Australia, London, the Netherlands, Ireland, and most recently as the head coach for the CP ISRA team in Spain. In Spain pardon me. Pam also teaches adaptive, adaptive physical education courses for Northwestern State University in Louisiana. She is the executive director of LA of La Gumbo, Inc., and is continuing to provide statewide competitive sports programs for students with physical and visual impairments. LA Gumbo Inc. is recognized as a Paralympic sport club, and Pam continues to provide a grassroots campaign to educate America on the opportunities and benefits of sport and physical education as practiced by persons with physical and visual disabilities. Pam works collaboratively with the Louisiana High School Athletic Association, ensuring the inclusion of both the wheelchair division and the paraambulatory division for track and field high school athletes. Pam has served on the junior 
Committee for Adaptive Sports USA for over 20 years, and she is on the national board for the Adaptive Sports Track and Field. Without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Colquitt to get us started. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me today. I'm excited to talk to everyone. Uh, and I would first like to talk a little bit about cerebral palsy. Um, it is a often misunderstood definition. It's a definition that has changed over the years. And I think that really having a good understanding of that definition will also be very helpful in an understanding of sport and recreation programming. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how we have defined how we define cerebral palsy and how that's changed over the past few years. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about pre prevalence, how cerebral palsy um, is defined in terms of parasport, and then also a little bit about the benefits of adapted sport and physical activity for individuals with cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy is the most common movement disability among children. The uh, prevalence of cerebral palsy has remained pretty stable over time. So any, in every 1,000 live births, there's typically about three to four uh, children who are, are born with cerebral palsy. However, cerebral palsy can occur after birth with um, in the uh, postnatal period, but cerebral palsy is not just a single disability. It actually refers to a complex set of neurological disorders that results in impairment that is permanent. Uh, we currently don't have a cure, but these impairments do not progress. As a matter of fact, with early intervention, with participation in uh, uh, things such as sport and recreation, these impairments can actually get better, um, or the symptoms can. It's, but uh, again, there is no cure, and there are a lot of different things that can result in the condition of cerebral palsy. But what I like to say is there are no two individuals with cerebral palsy who are alike because the, the injured the injury to that particular part of the brain is very unique to the individual. So like I said, uh, there are two types of when cerebral palsy can occur. Typically about 85 to 90 percent of the cases uh, occur at or, or before or during birth. But acquired CP is something that can occur, and we typically say that overall cerebral palsy is caused by some type of injury to the developing brain. So we don't classify it as the same way as traumatic brain injury, but uh, so up to any type of injury to the brain up to 18 months uh, can be, uh, result in cerebral palsy. So one of the things that 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 the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine has done is we've come up with a definition uh, about 14 or 15 years ago for cerebral palsy. And we changed this for several different reasons. One, there wasn't a really good standard definition. Uh, there were a lot of misdiagnoses. And this still happens today, but with this new definition, that's a, a lot less likely. There are additionally, whereas we would label an individual with cerebral palsy with certain symptoms, uh, that was very problematic because we would really pigeonhole individuals into maybe a particular course of treatment um, or we would overlook other symptoms that really need to be addressed. So based on this, this need, uh, we, the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, uh, developed a new updated uh, definition. And there were several reasons for that. One, we understand a little bit about neurobiology. Our testing methods are a little bit better, so we can more precisely describe the type of brain injury. And we also really need to focus on function um, and hack in the way that we classify individuals. Uh, and how that function affects physical activity. 
So there are four areas uh, that we class that are important in terms of the definition of cerebral palsy. The first is motor abnormalities. So, and I know that Pam is going to talk a little bit more about this. So individuals with cerebral palsy can have uh, rigid muscles, hard muscles that is, uh, or they can have muscles that are, you know, um, not as hard. So those two symptoms are hypo and hypertonia. And there are many other uh, conditions of the muscles such as spasticity, which is a catch that causes the muscle to become rigid if we're trying to stretch it. And that can really affect um, and that is very specific to the individual. It's, all of these are things that we really consider uh, that must be considered when we are evaluating an athlete with cerebral palsy. Another is there's typically going to be some type of other effect on function, uh, <clears throat> so such as motor function, um, speech function, there's going to be some limitations there. And the very definition of cerebral palsy says that an individual is going to have some type of accompanying impairments. That means that they're going to have some type of uh, visual impairment. It could be speech. It could be attentional. It could be behavior. Uh, and it's important that we look for these other impairments with a CP diagnosis. So the other two areas are anatomical and neuroimaging findings. So we, we in the past, we used to classify individuals with cerebral palsy just based on uh, this category. So we would say that an individual with CP had uh, was hemiplegic or diplegic, uh, but now individuals with CP, we use that, but we also uh, have a much broader categories in addition to the to just the anatomical distribution. And another important is neuroimaging findings. That's very important for that initial diagnosis. That is going to really um, allow us to have a better idea of what symptoms that we need to look for. And finally, causation and timing are extremely important. We need to be able to determine what the cause is and when and why the, the injury to the developing brain occurred. So again, CP can be an acquired condition. Uh, so if it occurs in that manner, it can be as a result of head injury or meningitis, or um, if it's during or after birth, you know, there can be complications in that process. So the the most important thing is to, con is to realize that cerebral palsy is perhaps one of the most complex conditions uh, that we that we know about and because of those complex conditions they individuals with cerebral palsy have are at risk to s experience significantly higher mortality rates a and the number one predictor of mortality among individuals uh, with cerebral palsy is activity so it's very very important that these individuals are active and are participating in things like sport and recreation so one of the one of the things that goes hand in hand with uh, the higher uh, mortality rates and lower function is a poor quality of life. Um, so we all know that um, you know if we are not active, if we are not participating in things uh, in our community or in in other settings, that that can negatively impact our quality of life. But one of the primary reasons that individuals with CP have these lower outcomes is because they don't have opportunities for participation and activity. So ad, uh, adaptive sport is extremely important for individuals with CP. So especially when we compare individuals with CP to typically developing peers, there are there is a tremendous amount of research that directly relink that deck directly links these poor health outcomes, poor quality of life, and we're talking about quality of life in multiple areas. Uh, in addition to um, physical health, we're talking about mental health. 
uh, self-esteem, and even specific health outcomes that you wouldn't think would be associated with physical activity are, com specifically compared to kids without cerebral palsy. And even among individuals who, with CP who maybe they don't use a walker, maybe you wouldn't even really be able to tell that, that they have cerebral palsy, um, they are, most are not active enough. So one of the best ways that we can get kids with cerebral palsy active is to introduce them to uh, opportunities for sport. Now, all of those things that can, uh, all of those potentially negative outcomes related to quality of life and mortality, all of them can really be improved through opportunities related to sport. Not only does it involve, uh, offer opportunities for individuals with CP to participate with friends, it provides an outlet or an opportunity for moderate to vigorous physical activity. Moderate to vigorous physical activity is one of the uh, best predictors of uh, overall health of an individual with CP. Now, for individuals with cerebral palsy, this may look a little different. So we know that, for example, that individuals with cerebral palsy who maybe are just sitting upright in a power chair are, uh, are actually using energy to maintain that postural stability. So at physical activity is very different and very specific to the individual. Um, but any type of activity, any type of sport participation, that is especially when it's appropriate for the individual is gonna have tremendous benefits. The one thing that we have to keep considering is no two individuals with cerebral palsy are alike. So again, activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity for one athlete is gonna look a lot different for another athlete. And that's gonna be dependent upon that athlete's functional abilities. So the, the trade-off here is we wanna maximize the functional abilities of the individual while supporting and addressing areas of need. And it is kind of this um, paradigm that where a lot of individuals who maybe have a great deal of experience in adaptive sport, recreation, physical activity, uh, may see some athletes with CP as a particular challenge. Because again, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of individuals with CP who have a complex set of disorders. But if we focus on what the athletes are good at, um, then we really have, we really are taking the correct approach um, because we all like to do what we're good at. So not only is that motivational, but it really focuses on the athlete's abilities. Now, there are certain, depending on the individual, there are certain uh, conditions or tasks or games that, that may not be a good fit. Again, we're, we're trying to put, uh, set up our athletes for success and maximize those functional abilities. So if there are some type of perceptual motor disorders, uh, if they have any type of uh, visual impairment, then you may wanna start practicing in a closed environment. So what I mean by a closed environment is where there is nothing in the environment that's gonna require visual tracking and everything's gonna be controlled. So for example, a closed environment in a basketball game is shooting a free throw. Nothing's gonna interfere with that shot. Whereas shooting a, a jump shot in a basketball game is takes place in an open environment. You know, someone can block that shot. So by practicing certain skills in a closed environment, it ensures that the athletes are first getting acquiring the the core skills necessary and then we can introduce them into uh, other environments and that's really just best practice in coaching and skill acquisition as well now there are uh, other individuals who may have some limitations based on the anatomical distribution of um, their condition or based on you know oculomotor visual impairments that um that may, whereas open environments are, there's a lot of things going on that may be 
difficult for the athlete and it may pose a risk. But it's important that, again, everybody is focusing on the abilities of the athlete and that the athlete is involved in the decision making process because ultimately they are the ones who are competing. So some areas, as we balance those functional abilities while addressing areas of need, some things that need to be considered are strength. Uh, it's going to be important that you first identify what uh, parts of the body are really strong and then think about which sports or which tasks or which activities will maximize their current functional strengths. But at the same time during practice, we want to be sure that we're fo focusing on total athlete development. So, for example, an athlete with hemiplegia, we may choose, uh, we may teach them or coach them how to execute a certain skill in a sport a certain way based to maximize their functional abilities. But during practice and during physical activity, uh, we want to work on both sides of the body. And that the same goes for, you know, all the other areas. Um, we... Uh, a lot of research is coming out now that shows us how important doing fast movements, so high velocity movements are for individuals with cerebral palsy and their potential, the potential benefits on function and spasticity and some of those other symptoms. Uh, flexibility is always important as especially among individuals with spastic cerebral palsy. Uh, losses in flexibility can lead to contracture, so that's something that we really don't want. That may be perhaps one of the greatest benefits that uh, adaptive sport and recreation brings about for individuals with CP. Uh, in the practice session, we want to focus on, also on mo motor coordination and really teaching individual athletes uh, good sh movement strategies about how they can execute certain tasks. And then also perceptual motor capacity. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, motor coordination, but it's also important uh, to be sure that we are, if an athlete, for example, has uh, a visual impairment or an oculomotor impairment, we want to put them in situations that are going to maximize their abilities, but that doesn't mean that they should be, uh, that those situations should be completely controlled. So we want to focus on developing the total athlete. So as um, Pam is going to talk a little bit about the uh, CP Isra and specific programming, but um, bocce and CP football, that's European football, are two of the most popular sports. Uh, these are, and this really represents uh, the paradigm of potential sport opportunities for individuals with cerebral palsy. So bocce, uh, so everybody is familiar with bocce ball. So this is typically performed by, uh, by individuals in wheelchairs, and it's a modified ver version. And this is an, an example of a, of a sport that is performed in a closed environment. So individuals who are wheelchair users or who maybe use a walker would be really well suited for this. Whereas CP football, and if, if you have, have not been to the CP Israel website, there are some great videos of really elite athletes uh, playing uh, European football or what we say in America, soccer, and competing at a very high level and in, in an open environment. There are many other sports that are currently being in developed. Uh, in development across throughout the world, uh, frame football, race running, and in, in your um, and then wheelchair slalom are also individual adapted sports. So they uh, offer, offer a lot of potential for individuals across all levels of function. So some other t uh, common inclusive sports, um, you know, are uh, well. There's a, a wide list, but the main thing is to consider the functional abilities of the athlete. Uh, so, for example, we have sports that are specific to wheelchair users. We have sports, some sports that are specific to power chair users. Um, power chair football or soccer is a really offers the potential for some great competitive soccer for individuals with power who use power chairs uh, there's a different size ball and the goals are a little different the rules are a little different but it's really uh, that's a really great opportunity so the main thing is is to consider a couple things uh, one which is which I keep coming back to is maximizing the functional abilities of the athlete and then two 
what what is popular in that area? You want the athlete to be able to compete in something that is regionally, culturally appropriate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we classify sport among athletes with cerebral palsy. So what we talk about classification, the uh, IPC talks about grouping athletes into sport classes according to how much their functional impairment affects fundamental activities in each sport and discipline. What we're really trying to do here is to ensure fair and robust competition here. Uh, because we want all athletes to really be on a uh, equal playing field and to really compete with each other. Uh, that is really important. And there are lots of different things that go into those considerations. Now, the IPC or, or each, uh, each sport federation or each pair of sport organization must have and publish their own classification system. And these can be pretty complex. And again, it's, it's dependent upon the sport. And there are different things that we consider. So when we talk about classification for individuals with CP, it is a very precise process. It must involve at least uh, one medical uh, classifier and then one technical classifier. So the, it's, a, it's basically a four-step process in terms of the classification, uh, the evaluation. So the first is that they have to have some type of verification of the impairment. Um, then we're gonna have, we're, the athletes are gonna go through some type of physical and technical assessments to examine the degree of activity limitation within that uh, particular sport. Then we're gonna basically assign them to some type of sport class and then specifically the technical classifier is going to observe the athlete in competition and provide some additional uh, levels of classification. So, and this is, um, is just a brief graphic that kind of depicts how complex the different classification systems are. And this is broken up. You can see this in terms of summer and winter sports. And uh, if Pam would like to comment on this, please feel free, because she is actually a technical classifier. Um, so you can see how the environment and uh, other conditions can actually affect sport participation. Uh, so archery is a closed environment, so the primary movement characteristics are going to be limb deficiency, you know, some type of, um, you know, with the with the extremities, and then we can also see uh, impaired range of motion or uh, muscle power, and then changes in muscle tone or other symptoms such as ataxia where balance may be impaired, um, is, it can also affect archery. And whereas for other uh, sports such as goalball or judo, the only impairment that may be really significant is a visual impairment. Uh, and visual acuity and, and some of those underlying things that can, can be affected. But as you can see, it's very complex. Gavin, this is a great resource page and uh, I'll elaborate a little bit later on sport classification uh, under the coaching considerations because I feel like that it's very important for coaches to understand the entire classification procedure. And now as we move on to what community programs should know, I want to start off by looking at what some of the barriers are. Barriers include cost of the program, transportation to the center, how and where to exercise, whether or not a fitness center is even available, and the lack of energy and a lack of motivation that the person may have. As you can see from this slide, the two largest barriers for persons with disabilities are cost, and transportation. When it comes to space and venue considerations, um, we, we want to consider how much space is needed and what type of venue are we going to use. Well, you have to consider what sport is being played and what are the participants' functional abilities. For example, athletes who ambulate independently generally need no restrictions regarding space or venues. However, 
when the athletes ambulate using some type of assistive device, doorways may need to be a little larger, floors will need to be non-slip. And then when the athletes use a wheelchair, whether it's a power chair or a manual chair, everything about the venue will need to be ADA compliant, which means wider doorways, accessible bathrooms and locker rooms, proper ramps to get to the venue, and wheelchair-friendly flooring or terrain. It's also good to remember that athletes with CP perform better in warmer temperatures than in cold ones, especially when it comes to swimming. Whatever the venue, whether it be track, a track, a soccer field, a swimming pool, an outdoor archery range, or an indoor shooting area, it's important to consider the athlete's individual differences and their functional movement and abilities. Some of the medical concerns, every person with CP, I'm sorry, every person with cerebral palsy is different. Some may have no additional medical conditions, but, uh, but others may have secondary medical issues as well, such as seizure disorder. And coaches need to be aware of what to do in the event of a seizure. Coaches also need to be aware of any hearing or visual impairments the athlete may have so that they can make sure that hearing aids and glasses are worn appropriately. Coaches need to be aware of any medications that the athlete is taking and know what the medicine is for, as it may be for ADD or ADHD or any other behavior disorder. Communication is often difficult for persons with cerebral palsy and a communication device or some hand signing may be necessary in order to communicate effectively with the athlete. Difficulties in motor planning, sequencing, and representation may also exist. It's very common for persons with cerebral palsy to have poor motor coordination, which can affect one limb, two limbs, three limbs, or all four limbs. Less common medical considerations include the athlete having a neurogenic bladder or a shunt, in which case the coach should be aware of either of these. Travel when traveling with athletes who have cerebral palsy, consider accessibility to all places, as some may use arm crutches, walkers, a manual wheelchair, or a power wheelchair. Frequent breaks should be taken to prevent increased muscle spasticity and to allow for scheduled bathroom breaks for those affected by, neuro by neurogenic bladder. It's also a good idea to keep in mind the external and the internal temperatures as colder temperatures increase spasticity and tone. Sport classification is evaluated by impairment groups. It used to be called CP, stroke, and traumatic brain injury when they did the classifications. A few years ago, it is now determined by the impairment group. And that impairment group is for persons that exhibit hypertonia, ataxia, and or athetosis. Hypertonia is often given a spasticity grade on the Ashworth scale. An Ashworth grade of one must be clearly clinically detectable in one of the three types of hypertonia. The first type of hypertonia is spastic hypertonia. It's a velocity dependent resistance to passive movement with a clasp knife type of resistance. The second one is rigidity, a heightened resistance to passive movement of a limb, often referred to as a lead pipe type of resistance. And the third type is dystonia. And this is resistance to passive movement that may be focal, affecting the muscles of one limb or a joint, or it could be general, affecting the entire body. Contractions are powerful and sustained and can cause twisting and writhing of the affected areas. Ataxia movement is demonstrated and clearly evident during the classification process. And it's, it exhibits unsteadiness, incoordinated or clumsiness of vol volitional movement that results from either motor or sensory nervous system dysfunction. Athetosis, clearly evident athetosis is unwanted movement and posturing, and it is observable in at least one of the following incidences. Involuntary movement of the fingers, 
are the upper extremities, despite the athlete trying to remain still. Involuntary movement of the toes are the lower extremities, despite the athlete trying to remain still, are the inability to hold the body still. There's a constant swaying or, or gentle swaying of the body. Things to consider about coaching. Good coaches will evaluate the abilities and the level of function of each and every athlete, identifying their strengths and weaknesses in muscle strength and speed and flexibility and balance and motor coordination and in perceptual motor capability. Persons with cerebral palsy are on a scale that can range from one to 100. No two persons, as Gavin said earlier, no two persons with cerebral palsy are the same. The range can be from those needing total assistance to those that ambulate independently, having a very slight gait or arm deviation. In sports, we see athletes that use power wheelchairs, manual wheelchairs, walkers, arm crutches, race runners, racing wheelchairs, and for those that ambulate independently, we may see a mild gait deviation to a severe gait deviation and everything in between. Some are stronger on one side of their body than the other, and the range of abilities in a person with cerebral palsy can be massive. Coaches just need to keep a positive attitude and have a willingness to learn about this disorder. Some more things to consider, being aware of each athlete's capabilities and taking measures to prevent injury are of the utmost importance when coaching athletes with cerebral palsy. There needs to be an increased focus on flexibility, stretching, and providing extended warm-up time. Be aware that overtraining athletes with cerebral palsy can make them more prone to serious muscular and joint injuries. They need adequate rest and recovery time between training sessions. And don't forget the cool down and the stretching after a training session. This can prevent cramping and injury to the athlete. We have to consider the importance of stretching. Choosing an adaptive sports program can be very challenging. However, there are a few places you can search for online that might be helpful. It's always good to get recommendations from those you trust, and you need to make a few decisions beforehand, such as, do you want a recreational type of sport or a competitive sport? And if you choose competitive, how competitive do you want it to be? Locally, regionally, nationally, are you looking at international competition? And are you interested in individual sports or team sports? And how far are you able or willing to travel to find a good sports program for practice and for a competition? When you find a sports program, ask two questions. How many persons with cerebral palsy or other physical impairments have they worked with before? Second question, do they have any adaptive sports coaching experience, training, or certification? And if the answer is none or no for these two questions, ask them if they're willing to learn. And if they are, you've probably found a great program. When selecting the first sport that you might want to try, this is just my suggestion, it, I would go with individual sports because sometimes it's hard to find an entire team for like wheelchair basketball or something like that. But individual sports like track and field and archery, they're two of the easiest sports to try first. Track requires tennis shoes for ambulant runners and wheelchairs for those that, that need a wheelchair, which do not have, and it doesn't have to begin with a racing wheelchair, just a manual wheelchair. Field requires the basic equipment of a shot put, a discus, and a javelin, or even an adapted form of each. In the past, uh, when no equipment was available, but we needed to practice, we used a heavy weighted ball for a shot put, we used a weighted frisbee for a discus, and we used a broom or a mop handle for a javelin. But track and field can be practiced almost anywhere that is safe and athletes can begin by being 
on their high school team if they have a disability division or they can join USA Track and Field Club in their area. Archery can also be played sitting or standing and it requires a bow and an arrow. Individuals can begin their archery program if they're interested in school with their 4-H programs. There are some specific sports for CP. One of them is football seven aside, also known in, in the States as soccer. And it has been a part of the Paralympic Games since 1984. The sport is similar to football for able-bodied players with a few modifications, such as having seven players on a field at a time rather than 11. And the playing field is also smaller. Clemson University recently started a Paralympic soccer program for athletes with CP. So if you're interested, I think we've given that a resource on the next page. Bacha is a, is a game of strategy and accuracy that was originally played by people with CP. Now, the sport of bacha includes athletes with impairments that affect motor skills. Bacha was practiced for many years as a leisure activity until it was introduced in 1984 at the Paralympic Games in New York. It is played indoors on a flat, smooth surface where players must throw or roll or kick a colored ball as close to the white target ball as possible to score points. CP Israel World Games <clears throat> is a multi-sport event that takes place every three to four years, and it is only for athletes with cerebral palsy. After a 10-year absence, the CP Israel World Games were held in 2015 in England, then in 2018 in Spain. The next CP Israel World Games will be held in 2022. The site is to be determined. Events that are held at the CP Israel World Games are the ones that were held just recently in the 2018 World Games included para-athletics and race running, CP football, para-swimming, bacha, female CP football, and wheelchair slalom. As noted earlier in the presentation by Dr. Colquitt, there are 15 additional Paralympic summer sports and six Paralympic winter sports offered for persons with hypertonia, ataxia, and or apoptosis. Some equipment to consider for ambulant athletes with cerebral palsy, minimal equipment such as tennis shoes is needed. Specific sports equipment is all that's needed, like a shot put, bow and arrow, <clears throat> a discus, a javelin. Athletes with cerebral palsy who ambulate independently need only focus on proper footwear and specific equipment that is necessary for their sport of choice. Now, more equipment considerations for athletes who have difficulty with independent ambulation, they may choose the sport specific equipment they need, which might include a racing wheelchair. This is a three wheeled lightweight and a seating and positioning is very important. They have a kneeling chair or a foot with, or they have a platform for their feet. And when you use it, when an athlete uses a racing wheelchair, they must have a helmet. Basketball wheelchairs, <clears throat> they have a lot of camber in their wheels, and they most of them have a single tip wheel to prevent the chair from tipping backwards. Tennis wheelchair turns easily and also has much camber in the wheels, and it's very similar to a basketball chair. A fencing wheelchair, or the athlete's chair, that it's an athlete's regular chair that is locked into place and they are unable to move during competition. A race runner, which there's a picture in the center of this, looks kind of like a three-wheeled bicycle. Athlete, the athlete propels the chair with his or her feet and oftentimes has a, has a chest plate for them to balance on and lay up on. There's also a throwing frame. I didn't have a picture of that available, but if the athlete, if the wheelchair is not used for throwing field implements, a throwing frame can be used. And this is a square or rectangle seat. It cannot be higher than 75 centimeters. Uh, the feet cannot be on the ground. Knees must be against the back of the seat cushion. 
Strapping may be used to keep the seat and thighs in contact with the chair, and a bar may be used for stability. The feet and legs can be strapped with non-elastic material to prevent them from slipping or kicking out. The athlete is not allowed to lift the hips off the chair. The advantage of using a throwing frame for field events versus a wheelchair is that you can get much higher and taller, and therefore sometimes the throw is even further. A power chair, power soccer chair is a motorized chair with a cage-like protection for the feet and legs. A bocce ramp is used for BC3 bocce players who are unable to throw a bocce ball into the court and must rely on a ramp to get the ball released and a sport attendant that assists the bocce player. A hockey sled is used for sled hockey and it's played on ice in a protective fitted bucket, bucket type um, sled. Regional competitions that are offered, and usually all of them are in the spring, and this is just a list. This is not every single one of them. This is a large list. These are sanctioned competitions throughout the United States. All of these events that you see include track and field, and many of them include additional sports, and the, which might include, they may have swimming, they may have archery, they may have table tennis, they may have shooting, which is also air guns, they may have powerlifting available. They may have wheelchair basketball competition, sitting volleyball competition, and wheelchair tennis. Once the schedule has been completed, you'll be able to find this information on the Adaptive Sports USA website, which is on the next slide. But as you can see, there are lots of places that athletes can go if they want to compete in disabled sports. Some of the resources for these uh, sports is, as I said before, the Adaptive Sports USA website, the Disabled Sports USA website, U.S. Paralympic Sports Clubs. This is where you might go to find a community organization near you and Blaze Sports America. And then I added some other resources about Clemson University who just started the CP soccer program. And there's also a website for CP ISRA. There's some very good videos on that. And for USA Bacha. Now we'll go to questions and answers. All right. Sorry about that. Give me one second. All right. So yeah, if we have any questions for Gavin and Pam, I've, I've got one in the queue right now, but if you want to go ahead and type them in there, I'll read them out and let um, Gavin and Pam address them. So one of the first questions that we have for you guys is, can motor functions progress over time? Gavin, I'll give that to you. Okay. Um, yes, uh, they can. Um, but that's there are a lot of things that go into that. Um, there's going to be improvements in function, you know, with age. That's part of the normal motor development process. Uh, one of the things, unfortunately, that we see a lot of is that once individuals leave school, they get their function usually declines. But the number one predictor of that is physical activity. So for individuals with CP who maintain high levels of activity, they can, especially when they're younger, improve function over time, and they can maintain that function as they get older. Excellent. So it looks like we have another one. Um, you had mentioned Pam or Gavin, um, that some easy programming, if you're looking to start up programming um, from a community standpoint, to start with might be track and field and archery because there's limited kind of equipment use. Would you give us uh, maybe one or two other examples of very easy, not too expensive programs um, for CP athletes? Well, if we go back to the slide, or if you look at the slide that has the Paralympic Sports by Impairment Group, and you can see that those with cerebral palsy or hypertonia, ataxia, so acidosis, can also select, uh, besides archery and uh, track and field, they can select badminton, 
They can select uh, Vacha. They can select cycling, equestrian, fencing, paratriathlon, powerlifting, rowing, rugby, shooting, soccer seven aside, which we already mentioned, swimming. Swimming is very good if you have access to a pool. Table tennis, tennis, and track and field. And then, of course, I don't want to leave out, I'm from Louisiana, so I always leave out the winter sports, so I apologize for that. So they also can be involved in alpine skiing, biathlon, cross-country skiing, curling, sled hockey, and snowboarding. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Any specific medical considerations that coaches should ask of a participant looking to join their program, uh, maybe helping them direct them to a sport that's better for them or to make sure that they're, the coaches are prepared for that athlete? I guess another way to phrase it would be if, if I was if I was a coach or if someone was a coach in a community program, what what questions should I be asking of my athletes before they arrive so I'm prepared? Uh, one thing I would suggest is, you know, some type of, of screener uh, um, such as the uh, the physical activity readiness questionnaire, the PARQ. Um, they have some different types of screeners for athletes, um, you know, Paralympic athletes. But uh, there are some common ones in CP and Pam. Help me, uh, help me out if I'm leaving any out. Um, you know, some things that could be uh, particularly of concern. Um, you know, are um, the if the individual has any type uh, a feeding tube or any type of that based on severity um you know any type of uh like bladder issues like pam was talking about um any seizure disorders medications things along those lines uh, those are the big ones that stick out to me and a coach needs to be aware I mean, the coach needs to do a screening and he's going to ask some have to ask some very personal questions uh when if he if he if the athlete wants him to help him uh, because he's going to have to we're going to have to know all of these limitations and one of the screenings we do or actually one of the tests we do in um, at, when we're classifying is we do the, a lot of the coordination tests both with the upper upper uh, limbs and the lower limbs because we want to know how balanced and how coordinated that athlete is and what events that what what things would limit him? Can he not use his left side at all? Uh, does it, what kind of use does he have with that side? Uh, is he able to skip or run? Uh, and many athletes, one thing many people don't know, I know how important it is for athletes and young, especially young athletes to our young children to ambulate independently. And if they can't ambulate independently, they, the next step seems to be going to arm crutches or a walker. And they seem to, and, but in sports, sometimes the wheelchair is just a piece of sporting equipment. The athletes do not have to be what they say bound or, can, or have to use a wheelchair in everyday living skills in order to use one for sport. And I just use an example of wheelchair basketball. Many times in wheelchair basketball, when the game is over, you see many of those athletes standing up and walking away from the chair. So you do not have to be an everyday wheelchair user to use some type of seated device, whether it's a throwing frame, whether it's a sled for sled hockey. Typically, people with some... Um, coordination issues that make it unsafe for them to ambulate independently in a sport will will prefer to be seated for their sport and that's okay great another question so not a paralympic sport so not a paralympic sport i do quite a bit of gymnastics with some of my folks with cp for core work heavy work balance and coordination etc have you heard of many benefits from this, such as like cross training, I guess? Can, can you say that one more time? 
Sure, sure can. Though not a Paralympic sport, I do quite a bit of gymnastics with my folks with CP for core work, heavy work, balance, coordination, etc. Have you heard of many benefits from this? Is this maybe cross training benefit? Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm currently aware of um, those types of movement programs. So gymnastics. Um, there there are a few programs that are out there and. We've actually done some studies, uh, a lot of studies with dance and uh, ballet. There's actually a really big program in New York. Uh, and um, rock climbing as well uh, is a pretty big adaptive sport. I'm trying to think, I can't think of it off the top of my head, where they have the big adaptive rock climbing program. Um, it may be at Syracuse. Uh, with someone uh, I know there, but uh, any any types any type of sports, any type of activities related to that have a lot of benefits. Um, you know, there's going to be potential benefits in gait, in postural stability, core stability, and those are going to really improve uh, function and prevent things such as uh, potentially prevent things such as falls. I think those are awesome. I mean, not everybody, and you know, very small percentage of, of us are going to be Paralympic athletes. So I think any type of activity that this athlete, this person is doing, still makes them an athlete, and uh, whether it whether it's uh, done on a recreational basis or not, and they are doing so much good for their body by staying active in gymnastics and, and the flexibility and the stretching and the balance is so important, especially with cerebral palsy. All right, I think that's all the questions we have. I'm gonna go ahead and, so that you guys have a record of it, pull up the resources while I go ahead and move on to our closing. On behalf of the Blaze Sports Institute for Adaptive Sports and Recreation, I would like to thank you for your participation in our 2018 webinar series. All of our resources will be available with the full presentation on our website for reference, which will be connected to their YouTube page. Thank you to Gavin and Pam so much for their time and effort on this project, as well as the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation for their ongoing support. A quick survey will be linked at the end of this webinar. We look forward to the feedback on the presentation, as well as any future topics you would like to see covered. We hope that you will join us for part three for people with amputations on November 26, from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Thank you everybody so much and have a fantastic day.